All right. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ben, uh, and I'm the country manager for the for the US. Um, and we've got uh, Amanda Rotella from our team, who is our in-house engagement expert. Uh, and she'll be leading most of uh, today's session. Uh, I just want to want to, you know, uh, kind of put it out there that this webinar really is for everyone. You know, whether you're just starting an engagement or you've been doing it for a while, uh, whether you're a planner or working on a parks or, uh, or in transportation or you're in the mayor's office, or even if you're at a nonprofit and you've got a community that you're trying to engage, uh, we see this session and really as a, as a general overview uh, for everyone in which we showcase some of the um, really the, the engagement strategies and frameworks that, that we use with our, our current uh, uh, group of cities and, and organizations. Um, and of course, because this is a, an engagement, we are an engagement company and this is what we do, uh, we're going to engage you during this, this webinar. Uh, so we've got a couple of different polls that will pop up sporadically throughout the presentation, as well as a, a survey in the end. Um, and of course, if you have questions, please use, there's a Q&A feature. Uh, you know, I think hopefully everyone knows Zoom pretty well by now, but please use uh, the Q&A feature throughout the uh, webinar. We'll try to answer some of those questions live, but if not, we'll, we have a Q&A session, a Q&A, um, about 15 minutes reserved for Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, all right, enough from me. Uh, Amanda, you wanna say hi? Yes, hi everyone. Um, my name is Amanda Rotella. And I am the government success manager at Citizen Lab. My background is in the public sector. I spent the last 10 years working for and with local governments and with uh, local nonprofits doing community engagement and project management. So this is really my area of expertise and my passion. And I'm really excited to be here with you today to, to talk through some engagement strategies. A little bit of a breakdown of who is here with us today. <laughs> Excuse me. You can see we have people from all over the United States. I'm also seeing in the chat that we have a bunch of people visiting us from Canada. And you can see sort of the breakdown of who is in attendance in, in terms of you know, the kind of organizations that are represented here today. And to kick us off, oh, there we go. So that sound means that it's time for our first poll and we're interested in getting to know you a little bit better. And so I'm gonna ask Ben to launch our first poll and please share with us um, a little bit more about your background in engagement. Have you done online engagement before? What kind of engagement tools have you used in the past? Please select all that, that apply to you. And you know, how does your leadership team think or feel about engagement? And so we'll give you just a a little bit of time here. Great, seeing a high level of participation. Thank you all. And we'll just give it about another 30 seconds here. Um, and while we're, we're waiting for those, you know, I wanna do a couple of shout outs to people here we've got in the chat, people from uh, Portland. I see some people from Washington State, Olympia. Um, we've got, some people from New Bern, North Carolina, New York, New York, from Ben's part of the Ben's part of the country. Great intros. Yes. Yeah. Baltimore City, Toronto, Canada. Welcome. All right. Well, I looks like we've got a good amount of participation. Let's go ahead and close the poll and check out the results. Awesome. Okay, so let's do a little debrief here. Have you done online engagement before? 74% of you, yes. Okay, so we've got some, some skilled practitioners uh, in the house with us. What kind of engagements? Lots of surveys, lots of in-person events. Awesome, excellent. And let's see, how does our leadership team think and feel about engagement? Um, mostly supportive. That's really, really excellent to see. Um, some of them are supportive, but don't really understand the resources needed. And, um, and that's a little bit of what we'll talk to today is about some of those constraints about really being able to, to have the resources or with limited resources, how you have successful engagement. Excellent. Thank you all so much for participating. And, you know, as all discussed, as we get further along, you know, reporting out results is really important. So we'll be sharing all of these results with you in a follow-up email. 
So let's talk through our agenda for today. So um, we just completed our welcome and introductions. We're gonna talk through some key considerations, things for you to be thinking about before you start doing engagement. And then really the meat of our time today, we'll be thinking about some of the, the typical challenges and constraints that come up and how do we tackle that? Um, some tips and tricks for addressing those constraints. And then I'll show you some engagement strategies for when you have limited resources, um, I've built out some methodologies around, you know, how to approach every part of engagement when you're dealing with limited resources. And then we really want to reserve a good chunk of the time at the very end for, uh, for Q&A and really engaging and getting some back and forth with you all. So I encourage you to use the chat box. If you're having any issues, please reach out to Ben or our colleague Vanya directly. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and jump in. First note, though, a quick note on surveys. The title is more than a survey, but I do not want to hate on surveys. Surveys are a straightforward way to get feedback. You can ask all your questions at once. You get a bunch of nicely organized data. And, you know, kind of probably the best part of surveys, you can avoid getting yelled at directly. And so these are all really good reasons to use surveys. I do not want to hate on the survey. A couple of things to think about, though, when you are using surveys. Really from an organizational sort of bird's eye view, thinking about how many surveys that you put out a year. Are they happening at the same time? Are multiple departments putting out surveys at the same time? And, and are you asking the same questions over and over again? You know, really thinking about how to be more strategic from an organizational level. And if you're using different tools, thinking about how you can all consolidate onto a single tool with a single account. And really this allows you to be more, you know, to have a single brand with your surveys that represents your organization. And then also to share data. You know, I think about, you know, the planning department may be doing a survey on a comprehensive plan update. Well, you're asking translate related questions that might be of interest to public works. And so you wanna be able to easily be able to share that data. So a couple of things, being careful of survey overload, overload be, making sure to use a, one tool across the organization. And then really important is sharing out the, the data that you get from that survey, really keeping it from being this black hole where people put provide information and then they never hear from you again. And this is one way of continuing to build trust and encouraging people to take your survey the next time. All right, so let's jump into some key considerations. Before you start, it's super important to think about where you are in your process and where does engagement fit in. And really, this is about not putting the cart before the horse. You know, I know that I've been guilty of, you know, trying to throw in engagement into a project after it's already underway, or perhaps I've inherited a project from another colleague. And so really trying to, you know, scramble to figure out, okay, how do I, how do I get the community involved and engaged and bought in? So first step is, where are you in your process? And, this, and figuring out where you are in your process will inform how engagement fits in, the kind of questions you need to ask, how to structure your engagement. So let's walk through this together. You know, you might be at the very beginning, you're looking to identify the problem and you really may be looking to understand the problem. And so, you know, perhaps you have identified with data that you have a, a very dangerous intersection, but you wanna understand what, what are the nuances of why it's so dangerous. I mean, many of us live in the community where we work, but we see things through a civic lens. And so we don't always understand the nuances of every problem. And so you wanna involve the community to better understand the problem. But perhaps you've already identified the problem and you're looking to start generating solutions and you wanna open it up to the community and get some feedback around how can we creatively solve for our problems. So an economic development example, for example, you may have a empty city parking lot or empty city dirt lot, and you're looking for ways on how to activate the space. Perhaps you're, you want to open it up to the community and various community organizations to come up with ideas or proposals on how to activate that space. But perhaps you have identified the problem, you've come up with some solutions, and you are at the place of wanting to make a decision, yay. Uh, you want to build consensus, you're looking to get some buy-in and get to a decision. Perfect example is in recent years where we've seen ARPA funding. Well, perhaps you as a city have identified that there are eight potential uses for your ARPA funding and you want some help prioritizing and getting feedback on, we can't do all of them, so what's your top four? 
and you're really looking for that help in in kind of zeroing in on the decision and then you know bringing it to your decision makers for a decision. And then lastly, perhaps you've gone through that entire process cycle and you are at the implementation phase. You know, for example, perhaps you have created your active transportation plan and now you're looking to implement some bike safety measures. And so you're hosting a bike safety workshop and you're looking for the public to come and attend and, and engage and participate in that way. So these are sort of the four general areas of where you might be in your project and, you know, recognizing that there are lots of circuitous pro projects that happen, but generally these four, and if you can figure out where you are in your process, you can then identify how to engage within that, that phase. So I want you all to kind of think about uh, where you are in a current project that you're involved with. Think about a single project that you are currently working on and think about where you are in the process and where you think you can in incorporate engagement. And so we're going to do, oh, my music isn't happening. There we go. <laughs> poll time. I'm going to ask Ben to up, put up our next poll and to just provide some feedback on either a project you're working on now or a project that you recently completed. Where did you integrate engagement into your process? And if you're feeling super bold, put into the chat, you know, what the name of your project is. Awesome, thank you, seeing some participation. Thank you all. And I promise there are a total of four polls. So our fun little jam, it, it's not gonna be a, a sound that then, you know, earworms into your head. Excellent, yeah, we're seeing 70 cents for, okay, great. Yeah, I'm seeing affordable housing, all of the above. Yeah, 2030 strategy for local school district. Yeah, absolutely. I am. I really want to do a quick shout out to Anne here. You make an excellent point. There are some projects that are, you know, so big and so nuanced that it does require engagement at every one of those phases. So yeah, that's an incredibly important point to put forward. Thank you. Yeah, transit development plan, excellent. Bike ped plan. Yep, all of this is really great. Yeah, thank you all. All right, so let's go ahead and close our poll and, and share out the results. So we're seeing a, you know, a high amount of engagement happening in these first three phases, which makes a lot of sense. You're getting this, get us, getting your citizens and constituents involved before a decision has been made, before implementation happens is really important for relationship building and just getting general buy-in. So I really want to apply, applaud all of you that are, are working with your citizens to identify problems, generate solutions, and then ultimately coming to that decision-making place. Yeah, excellent. I'm still seeing some more come through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you all so much. So I, not to put someone on the hot seat, but um, Mary, I see you put in water, street, bike, and ped plan. If you feel like sharing a little bit more about the kind of engagement you're doing, feel free to unmute yourself. All right, I put you on the hot seat. No problem. <laughs> but thank you all so much for participating. And this is really helpful to inform as we move into our the next parts of our Oh, we can't speak as attendees. Okay, thank you, Vanya. We'll have to give some, give some power to people when we get to the Q&A section. Thank you. All right, so once we've figured out where you are in your engagement process, another thing that's really critical is to think about outlining the entire engagement process at the time of engagement. So you're, you've invited people to come participate with you, come participate in engagement and activity. At that time, you wanna be able to lay out the entire engagement arc. So really detailing for them the before, the current thing we're asking you to participate on and what happens after. So be the before section, really thinking about how did we get here? What led up to this point in the process? Are there relevant background materials that you need in order to be able to fully engage in this moment? And then critically thinking about the after. So you wanna be able to tell people when they come to engage with you, how their feedback will be used, make a commitment to them at that time to report out and invite them to come back to see the results and really provide an overview of decision points and next steps. So when will it go to your board and commission or council or when will construction on this project begin? Really this after piece is key for building trust and getting people to participate next time. You know, you're really having to sell people on you know, first engaging and, and, but really part of that is explaining how, why their engagement matters and how that engagement will be used. 
So we went, we went through and talked through those two key considerations, really identifying where you are in your process, making sure to outline the entire project phase for people. And we're gonna go ahead and jump in now into some challenges and constraints. So some big things that we hear from the clients that we work with, here's some of the key, piece, key things that they come up against um, around engagement challenges. So the big one is staff capacity. And, you know, I think this is probably a universal in the public sector is having so much to do and not enough time or resources. So a first question. Oh, there we go. Our third of four polls, I'm going to ask Ben to put up our third poll around how many of you have dedic a dedicated individual or team that is focused on outreach and engagement. And you have some options here. Maybe you have a full team. Maybe you only have a single, you know, a single person, or maybe you are doing engagement and outreach on top of all the other work that you're doing. And this is one of those polls that we probably already know the question, the, the response to. I'm going to assume that many of you have engagement happening on top of the existing work that you're doing. Yeah, and we're looking at the poll results coming back in. There's about 60 of you that have participated. We're seeing the grand majority providing that feedback. Let's take a look at the chat. Oh, awesome. Okay, we've got some potential collaborations happening there. So we'll have Ben and Vanya noting all of those. Excellent. Okay, Ben, that's looking like we've got a good amount of participation. Yeah, let's go ahead and share. So yes, so we do have a, a good amount of you who have a staff member or a team whose only job is to do outreach engagement. Yay, lucky ducks, and also super fun for that person that they get to do that full time. But it looks like the grand majority of us are dealing with you know, this kind of holding that engagement and outreach responsibility on our shoulders in addition to the hundreds, if not thousands of other responsibilities and roles. Yeah, that's really helpful for us to know. And it, and again, that's a big piece that we're hearing from our, from our client base. So a couple of tips that I have for addressing that staff capacity, really the biggest one that comes up is use technology to your advantage. There are lots of online engagement platforms available out there. You know, I encourage you to go out, explore, find the best one that works for you. But I'm telling you, online community engagement platforms will make your life easier. You know, it really helps you to get organized. The tools within a platform help to lay out the entire project for you. You have all of your engagement tools ready to go in one place. It makes it easier to do analysis and share feedback, both internally with your, your colleagues, but also out to the public. Often many of them have project templates. So it allows you to just, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You get to use, you know, tried and true practices and, and also it becomes a single place to promote to your, to your community. So rather than like sharing, like, you know, the short URL for this survey and come visit this engagement, you know, page for our water related project, every single time there's engagement, you're pointing people back to the same platform. And so then you get to build on that engagement momentum and, and reach out to people that have participated before and you're getting this online, you know, ever growing, you know, list of community members to participate. So I encourage you to find an online engagement platform. And just to share a personal example, you know, I, when I worked for the city of Santa Cruz, we did not have an online engagement platform. And so I want to share a project that I worked on, which was the Downtown Library Mixed Use Project. And I created this project webpage within our city government, uh, in city government website, which I'm sure many of you have similar setups. And I created all these buttons and I had to drop in all the background and from background materials and was linking to engagement that took people off of this website. And I will say I was super proud of having stood this up. But had I had an online engagement tool, it would have cut my time in half. It would have been a hell of a lot more fun. And it would have, you know, been a lot easier for people to come and navigate. You know, you can see here our project update page was just, you know, it's in list form. So a little bit hard to digest. You can see I also did little update videos here as well. So I encourage you to use technology to your advantage. And let's get our presentation going here again. Um, other couple of things to think about, really planning out, blocking out weekly time on your calendars when you're doing active engagement, 
don't save the processing of all of the feedback and questions to the very end. Set aside an hour or two every single week, block it out, preserve it on your calendar to answer questions, to start processing inputs, get, start getting that initial feedback. And of course, always the plan ahead. And this one I think is probably the most challenging one because you know by the time you're wrapping up one project, you're like jumping right back in to your next project. But as much as you can plan ahead and think strategically about this is my project, this is where I want to engage with people, this is how it's gonna look, it'll make your life a lot easier. So what's another one that we hear a lot around is we are not marketing professionals, typically those of us in the public sector. We oftentimes have PIOs or you know, community engagement specialists who bring that expertise. But for those of us wearing the engagement and community hat, in addition to lots of other hats, promotion and communication strategy can be a real barrier and challenge. So a couple of things. My first one is a bit annoying. You know, Social media, it's sort of a uh, task that has to happen, but it's not super fun, just do it. It's a big way of how people are getting their information right now. And so again, making an effort to have those updates happening on social media, really getting, uh, you know, concrete content about your project. Unfortunately, social media, you just have to do it. But a key tip that I have is to engage partner organizations. Really, you can have those organizations who are willing to amplify your communications on their social media channel, across their newsletters. Um, you know, Maybe they're willing to house a, a, a clickable button on their website. Really be strategic and, and get some of your community partners who have great, you know, a great emailing list to work for you. I always recommend you loop in the local press because there are a lot of community members who still get their, their news from, you know, from print media or online media. And then lastly, ask your electeds and leadership to share with their network. I know when I worked for the city of Santa Cruz, some, some of our elected officials had really huge social media followings. And so ask them to be promoting and sharing as well, if it's appropriate and if they're comfortable doing that. I encourage you to talk with your leadership before making that ask, but, but think of it as part of your engagement strategy. And then lastly, get creative. Uh, these are two examples from existing clients. Shout out to Visit Durango, who recently started a giveaway on social media. If you're really, if you sign up for their engagement platform, you're entered to win Lyle Lovett tickets, which for me would have been a huge draw. And then we also had a, one of our European colleagues uh, in our European clients in the city of Ghent who did this whole outreach and awareness campaign where they put up these ladder-like chairs all over the city, encouraging people to see their city from a different perspective, and then pointed them to the online platform to share feedback. So really uh, a, a really fun and, and great way to like meeting people out in the community and pointing them to an, to an online activity to provide engagement. Diversity and inclusion strategy. So another one, you know, it, it has been really, amazing to see how how much you know this is becoming a priority for for local cities and for organizations really thinking about bringing more voices into the conversation and and wanting to expand beyond the you know people we always hear from and so really the first step around this is to identify whose voices are missing from the conversation at Citizen Lab, we just released this representativeness dashboard, which will allow people to see, which will allow you know cities to see who's participating and compare that data directly with your census data. So it it's putting it right out there for you. You know who's missing from your conversation? Are you getting a true representativeness? So I encourage you to be you know as you're collecting demographic data in your outreach to really to be comparing it with your census data, with your neighborhood data, really knowing you know who's who's missing. Another one I encourage you is to work with community partners. So the city of Seattle is actually doing an excellent job with this. They have started building out contracts with community-based organizations who have direct ties and relationships with certain demographics in their community. And they are, you know, charging them with doing engagement and outreach on their behalf. And it's really allowing them to reach, you know, pop target populations where, which they can't re reach with their own resources or, the, or you know, relationships and skill sets. This is a way to really, you know, lean on your community partners because you can't do it all. I also encourage you to meet people where they're at. So this one does require a little bit more effort because you have to go out into the community um, and, and, and really, you know, do that in-person work. But, you know, we're, we are seeing great examples of success coming for, for organizations that are willing to do that. The city of Struthers, another one of our, our partners, 
um, recently partnered with the local school district and hosted events at the high school. And they saw just a huge uptick in youth engagement in, in their comprehensive plan update. Um, you can see this picture of me. I hosted an event at a uh, brewery. We were targeting young professionals and we had great turnout at a brewery because, you know, who's, who's not willing to come and drink a beer and, and share their opinions. And um, I also partnered recently with a local food bank to, when they were doing, you know, a food handout, I was engaging the population that they were, that they were connecting with. So really, you know, work with your community partners, go out into the community. And then this is the bell I'm going to keep ringing follow up. You've got to report out to, to the people that you've reached out to, you know, it's really key for relationship and trust building, especially with those populations who have been historically or presently left out of the conversation. And, and, uh, you know, it's important to not just, you know, show up, hey, give us your feedback, and then not, you know, not going to connect with them until the next time you need them. Have that follow up, show them that their, their voice matters, that it impacted your process. So really, follow up is key on this one. Responsiveness and transparency. So this is another one. This is obviously a key tenant and you know requirement for those of us, especially in the public sector, but ways to kind of be living that out and, and regularly keeping that as part of your participation strategy. Um, one of the first things I recommend is having a public place for questions. Um, I know I've been guilty of just having an email and saying, you know, so just send your questions to me via email. It, you know, it, it's just easier that way, you know, from a staff perspective. But from a community member's perspective, it may be really helpful to have a public place where you can see the other questions. Um, it becomes sort of a, uh, you know, online ever updating FAQ page. So I want to show just a, an example here from the city of Wichita. They have, they're using their community platform as a way to to field questions. So they have, the, this is their platform here. They're dealing with public safety issues and all of the general questions and concerns can be, can be loaded up here. So people can ask their questions. You're seeing, you know, feedback happening directly in real time. And that allows, you know, other commu community members to to participate in the discussion, to see those responses, and it becomes a public place for Q&A. And heading back to our... So City of Wichita doing a great job of having a public place for questions and answers. Uh, another one, you know, again, reporting out, this is, you know, again, the, the thing that is most important and often gets left out, you know, continuing to report out, that's part of responsiveness and transparency, ensuring all materials are easily available. So this one is a little bit nuanced because, you know, at, in the public sector, you know, we live under the rules of, you know, the Public Information Act, and so everything has to be out there. But if your project materials are spread out through, you know, the far reaches of your city website, it's not the same as having all of them in one place and available at the time of engagement. So really think about how you can bring all of your materials together and make them easily available. And then lastly, demonstrating that you're that you are listening and that you do care goes a really long way. This is this is huge and, and one of the more challenging things, but I, I want to show an example from the from our partners over at the city of Bidford. They recently uh, uploaded have a new platform and one of the things that they did is they put their pictures and their names around who's listening, who is who is the you know quote unquote staff in the background that uh, that you'll be engaging with. And, and this I help, thought really helped to provide a face to engagement uh, and, and really let people know, like, you know, especially with Tim and, and Danica, they've got deep connections to the community. And so might be someone that you see out in the world and they're the ones that are listening to your feedback. So <laughs> yeah, we've got Tim there, Tim in the, in the audience with us. And uh, yeah, thank you all for attending. You guys are doing a great job. Uh, so keeping it simple, Oops, and I lost my full screen here. Keeping it simple, you know, K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. A uh, couple of things that are really crucial, and I know you all know this, but beware of acronyms. And if you're using acronyms, you know, don't assume that it's super well known. You know, if you're telling us what an acronym means up here, you know, repeat yourself over and over and over again translating your content for the general public. So this one is challenging because the more technical people in your organization, your planners, your engineers, may not be the best people to create content for the general public. So really identify who are those generalists on your team who can do sort of a you know, content review and help to 
simplify things down. You know, we do work in very nuanced spaces where details are important, but oftentimes that can be a barrier for entry for, for members of the public. And then lastly, you know, aim for a straightforward process, even for our more circuitous, you know, projects, you know, that library mixed use project that I, I noted as one of my projects when I was with the city of Santa Cruz. I mean, that was a 20 year project in the making. There were multiple engagement efforts that took place, but as much as you can lay out the entire process and where everything took place and let people know, you know, this is where we are in the process. This is where you're, you're jumping in. You know, it can be, it can go a long way for helping to, you know, provide the background information on your, on your project. Project. And I'm seeing a lot of people dropping resources into the chat. Thank you all so much. And thank you for sharing that great resource from uh, the FedGov. Ooh, plainlanguage.gov. Okay, that's a good one to, to note. Thank you for sharing. Okay, and I want to take a moment as we wrap up our challenges and constraints to just remind you all that you are awesome. All of you here are doing engagement and showing up to this webinar, you know, really shows that you care. And so you get an automatic A. And I wanna just let you know that it's okay to be creative and try new approaches. It's also okay to repeat the tried and true. And I also wanna let you know that you are not alone. When you have engagement efforts that do not go as planned, um, you're not alone. You know, in fact, I don't know if you have a thumbs up button, but if you've ever been in a place, it's been in a situation where you poured a lot of time and resources into putting up an event and no or very few people have shown up, um, you know, put a thumbs up out there. Uh, and I will give you like multiple thumbs up because I've been guilty of having that happen to me more times than I would like to admit. Yeah, thank you for that, that thumbs up, Sean. I appreciate you not leaving me hanging there. Okay, so let's talk about engagement strategies for limited resources. Really, you know, what does this actually look like? And I've been putting together these in these uh, methodology frameworks that when you that allow you to think about, you know, what kind of resources do you have? And then how does that translate to the kind of engagement you can really take on? And so I'm going to show you an example here around um, taking you through the entire process from beginning to end around, you know, where engagement fits in, what your engagement activities should look like, what your communication plan should look like. How will you moderate that engagement? And then, you know, what do you do with those results? So really start for, to start to finish. And again, this is kind of a way to templatize your engagement where you can really, you know, have some key, you know, your kind of simple, medium and advanced when you have more time or more resources and you can scale up engagement. But we're gonna be talking today about just sort of the like, you know, starting from the beginning you know, more taking it right beyond the survey, but not getting, you know, too crazy. So let's go ahead and jump in and, and talk about this first example. So a park improvement project, you know, so setting the stage a little bit, perhaps you're a parks and rec department, you want to involve your citizens in the upgrade of a local park. Um, you have limited time because you just found out about a grant application that closes in two, mo two months and you need to have a shovel ready project and limited staff because, you know, as we know, that's just how it always is. <laughs> so, you know, perhaps you're working with a project manager and a park planner and you guys are, are, you know, have limited time to run, moderate and report out on your engagement. So where are you in the process? So we are, we are at the generating solutions part of the process where you're wanting to really get, you know, feedback and buy-in from your community so that you can have a project design for that grant application. So what are our goals? Get input, you know, input and buy-in on what should be included in the new park and then engage the community early on so that, you know, if you're successful in getting the grant, you know, you can move forward and, and work within those timelines. So this is a three-part engagement process. The first phase is the engagement activity. So you as staff, you know, put out a, you know, a list of potential park components that, you know, and these, this list has been, you know, developed and vetted by staff. So, you know, all of them are achievable and you get feedback on, you know, uh, you know, do you want new park benches, bocce courts, you know, a shade structure for the picnic tables, recycling bins near the baseball field. You're putting all those options out, options out and you're getting feedback and prioritization from your community. So that's the first phase. The second phase is, is the analysis, really, you know, um, getting that analysis of the feedback and, you know, using it to develop your, your park design. And, and again, you know, 
ideal you have more than two months, but if you're, you know, operating on a tight, tight timeline, you know, keeping it really simple. And then finally, the last phase always has to be report out. You're reporting out on, you know, the feedback that you received and, and kind of where the final design is headed. So moderation. So during the engagement, you wanna be responding to all questions and comments. You know, again, that's part of that level of response, responsiveness and transparency. You wanna be, you know, providing clarification on the process. And again, I encourage setting up, you know, one to two hours a week to be doing, you know, that on, you know, consistent back and forth. And then, you know, the wrap up, you know, part of moderation around the wrap up is really, you know, responding to questions about the final design or what those next steps look like. All right, communication plan. So kind of two crucial phases, crucial phases, kickoff and wrap up. So from the kickoff, you have to really encourage you to have a multi-channel campaign to raise awareness and invite engagement and do that across social media, working with your partner organizations. Um, you know, if you have newsletters or local media, again, multi-channel, you know, get the word out any way that you can. And then around the wrapping up of the project, there are two kind of primary groups that you wanna be communicating with. The first is following up with anyone who participated in your engagement effort, anyone who you know, voted on you know, the park, potential park components, you know, really getting, um, making sure to close the loop with them. And then with the broader community, you wanna be sharing you know, what the process was and, and what the results of that process were. And moving on to wrap up and report out. So what kind of data are we, what that kind of data should we be collecting and what kind of data should we be reporting out? So the first one is participant data. So who participated, you know, thinking about that demographic data you wanna be able to report on and how did they participate? Did they, you know, were they voting? Were they asking questions? Did they attend an event? And then, you know, thinking about your engagement data. So really providing an overview of the process, all of the different opportunities there were for engagement and details about the feedback you received. Um, you know, really being clear, like these are the the thing, this is, these are the top four ideas that were prioritized and these are the number of votes that they received. And then really thinking about, you know, the next step. So it really explaining the approval adoption process and then provide estimates around timeline for implementation. And, and as you get to those, get to those phases in your timelines, you know, providing updates. So one, you know, if your council approval is a couple months out, you know, looping back and letting people know, hey, it's time now for the council improvement for this project that you helped provide feedback with X number of months ago. And so a quick note on reporting out, really, again, I, I will continue to harp on this because it's super important for relationship building. And I encourage you to share both the digestible and raw data. And so what exactly do I mean by that? You know, if in the case of a survey, you know, you want to be able to provide, you know, a couple of charts and graphs that give you like a snapshot of the feedback you received. But if you had sort of an open comment section, I encourage you to drop that entire, you know, a link to that entire spreadsheet in your report out so that for the people that want to, they can go and see that, that, that really individual data. And I would say most people probably won't dive into it, but it demonstrates the commitment to transparency, which is super important, again, for relationship and trust building. So we're going to wrap up this section with a quick poll and an example. Oh, there we go. So we're going to launch our final poll around reporting out. So when tying engagement to impact, you know, how are you reporting out? You, if you have the data in place, um, you know, how is that being communicated out to, you know, either your leadership or your public or, you know, internally? Um, and so it'd be helpful for us if you can, you know, put some answers in the chat or in the poll there. Yeah, thank you. And this is, you know, multiple choice. So if there are multiple ways that you're getting information out. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm seeing, Anne, thank you for your comment in the chat, you know, um, you know, have those six to eight key voices and perspective for in-depth interview. Absolutely. I mean, I encourage you to do in-depth engagement with some key stakeholders, um, you know, especially let's say with this park, it, park project, you know, perhaps meeting with the literally who uses the park or the school district or park users, having some in-depth interviews with a couple of key stakeholders really is, is incredibly fruitful. So thank you for adding that to the chat. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay, and Megan has said she's either putting a report or more often a follow-up email. Excellent. So let's go ahead and close the chat and take a look at what the results are that we have. 
So yeah, I'm seeing um, a lot of feedback here across the board in, in terms of how you're getting it out. It seems like a lot of you are, are making sure to you know, have a publicly shared you know, standalone document included in a staff report, you know, sharing internally, presentations of process and feedback, making all data available offline is a little less, um, is a little less uh, out there. But, you know, I really encourage you to think about how you can get data available offline. Um, if we have time, I can show you one of our examples from the city of Seattle. They actually have an interactive data dashboard that allows people to, you know, get to really get their hands on the data and, and explore, you know, what are the feedback that we're getting from homeowners or members of our, you know, Hispanic Latinx community. And so, you know, ways to kind of like make that data more approachable and I would say more fun to engage with. All right, so I'm gonna show you an example, a real time park example, um, you know, based on what we just went through our methodology. So this is the uh, uh, city of Carlisle. And uh, they are they were looking to up, up their you know fairground as linear park, and let's go to our gather feedback section. And so they put out a number of potential park improvement options. You can see here inclusive play equipment, basketball courts, youth playing equipment, adult fitness, and they invited their community to come in and help them prioritize. You know, we're going to make improvements to the park. What do you want to see? Um, and as you can see here, you know, the two top things that they have was an inclusive was inclusive play equipment and an interactive walking path. And excuse me, you can see it. You know, it's pretty pretty clear here what what the community wanted to to have, and they were able to get some buy in and feedback. They also created this, you know, share your thoughts if you had an idea um, that wasn't available here, providing some providing an option for that. Uh, and again, you'll get the links to all of these so you can go in and explore a little bit further. So looking at that example, you know, I showed you a really, you know, simple three phased, you know, engagement process. But if you have more time or, you know, are lucky enough to have more resources, you know, here's just two ways that you could sort of take it to the next level and, you know, quote unquote, spice it up. Uh, the first would be to allow the community to submit ideas for park components. So rather than having, you know, only having them vote on pre-vetted ideas, you know, invite them to, to put out ideas as well. You know, quick asterisk on this one, you know, you want to be really clear about the criteria with which, you know, ideas will be accepted or, or you know, make the cut. You know, you might want to let people know, you know, we have a budget, this is our budget and, you know, this is our timeline. And, and so people can provide ideas that are more realistic. And so you're not getting like, we want a water park at the local park. Um, and you have to go back and say like, that's not feasible for a number of reasons. But this is a way to, you know, bring even an, a higher depth and um, meaningfulness to your engagement. And then, you know, another way to spice it up, if you had more time and you can add an engagement activity, perhaps you've gotten feedback on the components and you bring back out, you know, two potential park designs and you allow the community to weigh on which one they prefer. It's just sort of another way of bringing engagement, you know, from the solutions, you know, phase into, you know, decision making and prioritization. You're adding more layers of engagement for the community. And one of the other examples I wanted to show was our active transport with an active transportation plan, how you you approach that with, you know, limited staff and limited time. But we have limited time as part of this uh, webinar. And so I want to make sure to get to questions, but I will send all of this to you in our follow up email and you'll get the full layout of how to run that engagement process um, in, in the full PowerPoint. But we're going to go ahead and jump to questions. We've got about you know, 13 minutes. So we want to make sure to get some of your questions answered, but also be super respectful of your time because I know you all have a lot on your plate. So with that, I'm going to bring Ben back into the into the conversation and and see if we have any questions that have been that have come up in the the chat or Q and A. And I also Vanya, if anything come up for you. Cool. Thanks so much, Amanda. That was that was really really great um, and uh, you know really comprehensive. So. Uh, I've got a few questions from those who sent in questions before, but also some that were submitted live. And so we'll try and go through them as quickly as possible so we uh, have enough time. So one of the questions, and a, different, a few different versions of this popped up, um, but one of the questions is how do we engage uh, low income or traditionally hard to reach communities? Uh, and on the flip side, how do we not stop and it's maybe limit the impact of the the voices of the same 10 people who show up again and again and again. 
Yeah, so I think this is a big one, you know, um, and as we mentioned here around creating a diversity and inclusion strategy, um, I think it's really helpful to to have a, you know, to know who you're missing from the conversation, you know, really be comparing your engagement data to your, you know, census data, you know, knowing, of course, that census data is not always fully representative, but it's a data set to be working off of. So really, you know, comparing that, you know, do you have an overrepresentativeness of maybe perhaps the, the uh, you know, white homeowner population? And so being able to really show the feedback that you're getting specifically from you know, your, your underrepresented members of your community. The city of Seattle is actually doing a great job with this where they're taking, you know, all of the data is available, but they're, they're highlighting feedback that they're getting from some of their underrepresented community members. So it may be, you know, here's the full data set, but here's some highlights. This is what we heard from renters. This is what we heard from our, you know, Asian American community members. These are, this is what we heard specifically from uh, you know, non-speech Spanish speaking members of our community. So you're really, you know, highlighting that as part of the larger data report out. Um, one of the other things that we're we're working at at Citizen Lab is offering texting tools um, as a way to reach people who may not have full access to, you know, to the internet or a computer or technological resources. Most people do have a phone, and so figuring out ways to engage people with the thing that they have in their pocket so that they can do it at any time and ways to sort of broaden that access. Um, but this is a really great question and, and one that we're continuing to explore. And I, I will also, you know, the, the Seattle example is a really great one and we can share more information out about that. And uh, thanks, man. I think that's that's uh, that's exactly right. And I guess as a flip side, right? So um, how do you deal with, or how do we deal with survey fatigue, right? If everyone's trying to reach these communities, right? And then are they getting the same questions again and again? Um, you know, how do we, how do you limit that? Or how do you, um, how does that work? Yeah, I will. I think, you know, to what I highlighted earlier, using the community based organization approach. So really working with your partners and being strategic about the kind of engagement that you're doing um, around, you know, certain target demographics um, can really help to limit that. So you're, you're going out and and asking community, you know, community organizations with existing relationships to do that engagement on your behalf. And so it just gets built into the kind of work that they're already doing in that in those communities. So it doesn't become a sort of one off or you're you're spamming them with engagement. It becomes more strategic because you're going through a community partner. Yeah, uh, I think that's that's great. Um, so one more, I, I think this next couple of questions are about um, you know, I think everyone on the call is bought in and sees the value, but I think everyone also has a few colleagues who are a bit more skeptical or don't see it as a priority. And so, uh, you know, how do we typically recommend and support our, our current clients in helping them convince their colleagues and, and whether that's a, someone else in their department or even elected officials of the value of community engagement um, and how it can, can benefit them and, and, you know, a government or an organization as a whole? Yeah, I think this is a really, you know, kind of crucial question um, around, you know, really selling the importance of engagement. I think on the one hand, you know, we are just seeing a, <clears throat> a shift in the expectations around local government. And so, you know, I, I know where I was working, you know, there was demands for, for community engagement opportunities from the community. And so, you know, it helps it when there's pressure from your community, but you being tr trying to be strategic as an internal player, um, you know, I think there are a couple of things that are important. One, you know, as much as you can limit the amount of people screaming and yelling at you at a community meeting and community engagement and, and a meaningful engagement with your community is one way to do that. So that's a, a little pro for your uh, pro tip for your elected officials. But also, you know, um, by having a really being really strategic about engagement uh, and and planning ahead, it can help you to limit the amount of resources that you have to put into it. It can help, you know, um, with public perception and, and your relationship with the community. And um, you know, I would say more than anything, you know, we just know uh, that having diverse voices involved in decision making makes for better decision making. It makes for, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, better processes. And so, you know, as we're seeing with our diversity, equity, and inclusion goals, you know, we want to have more people's voice in the conversation because we get better results. And, you know, I think we, there are data and case studies to prove that point. And you just have a happier community. And, you know, isn't that tough? Wouldn't that be nice? People are happier and maybe nicer to you as staff. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think this will probably be, we have maybe last question. Maybe we have time for one more after this. Um, and so to, a couple of these questions are all about how do you, you know, you open up the conversation, you start asking, you know, people for their thoughts and either they're, they're asking for things that are outside of your purview, right? It's actually a, mm -hmm. a county level or a state level, um, or they're asking for things that are not feasible for a variety of reasons, right? It's maybe it's a lack of funding or um, just a, a city department not working as well as it could. How do you handle that um, in a way that you're not throwing anyone under the bus, but you're also not discouraging people from um, continuing to engage and, and participate? Yeah, this is a really excellent question. And I think is it's one of the reasons that we often shy away from sort of opening up our engagement opportunities sort of beyond a highly structured survey or a highly structured process, because we are really concerned about setting ex expectations getting set that are beyond our control. And then we are we become the bad guy who always says no. So I think this is a really crucial one. And 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 I think there are a couple of ways to approach this. The first is, you know, before opening yourself up to any and all the ideas, being really clear about what the constraints are and what are the criteria under which you will take in new ideas. And then there is nothing wrong with being open and honest with people providing that feedback or those ideas about the constraints. You know, thank you so much for your feedback but that does not fit within our budget or thank you for our feedback. You know, I encourage you to reach out to our partners at the county who handle that, you know, so, and, and again, having that public forum for answering questions so that people can see the dialogue and back and forth. So, you know, being responsive to people and just continuing to reiterate what the constraints are. There's nothing wrong with saying like, no, we can't do that because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and just being willing to, to put it out there and, and having that level of transparency. Because, you know, either you can facilitate those questions in, in a, you know, public structured format where you can give answers or those ideas sort of take, take flight outside of your control. And so if you can have people asking those questions on your platform, that is the best case scenario because you have a forum for then responding to those questions versus, you know, you have a whole community, you know, uh, advocacy group that has stood this up and it has now become this huge thing. It's not something you can do, or it's not something that is, can be legally done. I mean, the legal constraints are a big one and you have no way to kind of like have that back and forth. So um, yeah, I encourage you to just be really open and honest about constraints and do it on your a, in a public place, on your website, on your engagement platform. Amazing. All right, well, I know there are a few more questions, but we're not gonna have time to answer all of them today. Uh, so if you have a question and it hasn't been answered, uh, we will follow up and happy to discuss uh, any of these with you um, afterwards. So I, yeah, I think we and have I will a... say, you know, you you're you will all be receiving a very meaty follow up email that will have data from all of our polls. Um, you know, all of the links to all of the resources we shared. Um, you know, any question and answer, and and then also a link to the PowerPoint slide. So you know, lots of resources coming your way. All right, should we go to the next? And Yes, we have before. two more slides, so hang with us. <laughs> so <clears throat> a question you all may, ask, may be asking is, is now what, right? I just, I, mean, I have some ideas about how to implement this, but you know, what, what happens next, right? And so uh, the good news is we have a bunch of tools available, a bunch of guides and resources, um, a lot of which are a lot more um, specific and purpose-built for different types of projects and plans. Uh, or uh, for different levels. So if you're even if you're just getting started or if you're more experienced, uh, there's probably a guide for you. If you need something a little bit more kind of custom and you want to just kind of talk through these things, um, we're also around. You know, we we really see the platform and the support, you know, Amanda uh, and our engagement experts provide as really interconnected. And so, you know, we're more than happy to to kind of start talking with you, even if you're not ready for a platform or if you're not ready to. Um, move forward in, in any kind of, um, you know, budget or anything like that, it's okay. I think what's important to us is that everyone is engaging well, and we, we want to support that. So, um, yeah, feel free to reach out. Uh, again, we'll send you links and all that good stuff afterwards, uh, but just to let you know that uh, all these tools and resources are available for you. All right. 
and irony of all ironies, um, we are ending this with a survey. <laughs> so we really want to hear from you. We want to hear how this went. So as you close out um, from this, as you leave the, the Zoom webinar space, a survey will pop up. As you know, engagement and feedback is really important. So we hope you'll take a time to just answer a couple of questions for us um, and provide feedback on, you know, are there future topics of a webinar that you'd like to see? Obviously, we had a limited amount of time, so we're just scratching the surface. There's so much to discuss. Um, but if you're interested in a, in a more open forum where we can have more, you know, back and forth or more webinars on specific topics, please share them in the survey. And with that, I want to just say a huge thank you for being with us here today. You know, it really um, means a lot to have you all show up. As I've said, you know, we've all been there putting a lot of time and resources and having no one show up. But uh, so it means a lot to me that you are here. So big thank you and reach out with any questions or feedback. Thanks so much, Amanda. And thanks everyone for joining and uh, expect an email from us very soon. All right. Bye, everyone.